Hello and welcome to the very, very first episode of Fate Lair. I'm super excited about finally getting things published. Uh, a bit nervous as well, but I think the content will make up for any shortcomings in the quality of the uh, recordings or, or any other things. And in fact, we're starting the series with Rand Fishkin, former CEO and well, still founder, but former CEO of Moz and now founder of a new startup called Spark Toro. The reason I was excited to speak to Rand is, uh, apart from the fact that he was um, always somebody I kind of looked up to from a distance, uh, I, never, I never met Rand, never interacted with him at all, but I, I fired him a, a, a message on LinkedIn and without any back and forth, without any uh, questions really, he immediately was like, yeah, sure, Richard, let's have a conversation. I'd love to take part in this. And I found that to be very um, both motivating for myself, but also it made me feel like, yes, this is the right thing uh, to be doing at this time. So we'll get into the conversation very soon. The things that stood out to me from uh, my chat with, uh, with Rand was really just how intertwined everything is with each other. So it's very hard to look at the climate problem without looking also at issues involved in how businesses are created and run, how capitalism works, and many, many other things that we currently deal with in the societies we we currently live and operate in. So that's it for now. I'll see you at the end of the episode for some concluding notes. And without further ado, Rand Fishkin. Hey, first of all, thank you so much for just getting back to me, booking a time and all of that stuff. We've never met, so I kind of um, expected that we might need to do a bit more um, sort of convincing or, or bothering people, but I'm getting a good response. No, no, um, I'm thrilled to hear it. Just to get started, um, you know, we, we, we know you very well from Moz, right? Um, but... Can you just tell us a little bit what you're doing now? Because you're doing something completely, well, not completely different, but different, right? Yeah, so yeah, no, definitely very different. This, this sort of like your version of what, what your current company is, what you're doing, the motivation behind it. It's not the main topic, but it's like a nice way of easing into uh, the conversation. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I started SparkToro about 18 months ago, uh, just after leaving Moz, which I, which I founded many years before. And SparkToro is uh, different on a number of vectors. So it's not in the SEO space. Uh, it's trying to build software around audience intelligence. So helping marketers and PR folks and product managers and entrepreneurs uh, understand the audiences that they want to reach and how to reach them and um, a lot of uh, deep data about what websites they visit and social accounts they follow, what topics they're interested in, what events and conferences they go to, uh, what podcasts they listen to, like this one. Uh, SparkToro is also very different from Moz in that it is funded very differently. So whereas Moz was a venture-backed uh, business, which is kind of a you know unicorn or bust type of model, yeah. uh, SparkToro is an LLC. It's funded by 35 individual angel investors and it has a kind of a profit sharing model. So a little more old school, but very unique in the tech startup space. Um, and we have open sourced our documents, hoping to encourage lots of other startups to use this type of a structure. And a few already have, uh, and a, a seed fund called Tiny Seed uh, is using our structure as well, which is really exciting. So we're hoping to start a movement around alternative ways to build a company Okay, well, that's super interesting. I, I didn't, I didn't realize that you had also been doing sort of open sourcing these. Um, you say like the, the articles and the way you've done the yeah. the, the process. If you if you Google SparkToro funding, uh, you will find our investment documents. They're actually in an open Google Drive file. Uh, our attorney prepared them in such a way we we paid a little extra so our attorney would prepare them so that anyone could download them and use them, uh, modify them with their own information. 
And I think well, that's a that's a great company to already have. Okay, so that's that's what you're doing now. Um, now, I guess the super simple question first of all is: I I dropped you a cold email. I think it was on LinkedIn, right? With like, hey, I'm this guy you never met. Do you want to talk to me about climate and sustainability and so on? Um, what, what what why do you why do you want to talk about that? <laughs> um, I mean, I think that along with income inequality, it's basically the biggest issue facing the planet right now, and I. Uh, I will admit to not being very savvy about uh, climate change. Maybe I'm, you know, in the top 50% of people who have knowledge about it, but certainly not the top five or 10. And uh, while I have passion there, it's not, it's not an area I've engaged in much. And so, yeah, I was curious to find out, you know, why, why does Richard want to talk to me about this? And, and what could I possibly have to contribute here? Um, and I, yeah, I'd be interested to to learn more and have that chat and certainly hope that by participating more folks who might be uh, interested in, you know, in, in my work or in my uh, background might pay attention as well and, you know, open their ears and eyes to what's going on. And um, yeah, hopefully together we can we can change some opinions. So, yeah, that's that's I mean, that's why Richard wants to talk to you <laughs> mainly. It's it's sort of something I, I I'm not an expert, but maybe I know a bit more than the average person because the average person knows so little, not because I know that much. Um, but seemingly in, in, in our industry, in tech and software, it's, I, I was surprised a few months ago to notice that nobody seems to be talking much about this. Um, uh -huh. So I kind of figure it's. Um, let's start talking to some people, people who know some things about this topic and people who don't. Um, so, you know, where, where do you, st when I was talking to somebody else, we sort of described this in a way of, it's, it's almost like there's a spectrum, right, in the world of uh, right now, where you have, on the one hand, you have people who are almost panicking, right? Uh, yeah. which is like, oh, you know, the world is ending next year or in the next 10 years or, so, or the world as we know it anyway. Um, yeah. And then on the other extreme, you have these, you know, uh, the, the climate science deniers. Sure. Who are kind of saying like, nope, this is not a problem. This is a, a PR stunt by some people who have like kind of an agenda. Where, where do you personally kind of fit over there? What's from the little, or little you know or read? Uh, sure. So I would say I'm much more in the, uh, we should be, generally speaking, panicking uh, more so than anything else. I, panic is maybe the wrong word because I think panic implies a lack of uh, thoughtful strategic action, right? It's sort of a, everybody, you know, run and lose your minds and, and not um, treat things uh, in a long-term strategic way. And, and I think that's not what's going to be helpful. So I, I agree generally with the, with the folks who say, gosh, we are uh, substantively ahead of all the climate change predict predictions or right on target. And that suggests maybe not in the next year or 10 years that uh, things will be, you know, um, whatever, apocalyptic, but certainly in the next 50 to 100. And, uh, and, and possibly in the next 25. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is, um, there's a, you know, there's a part of me that gets very frustrated with the concept of, uh, let's see, personal responsibility in a very small scale way uh, and not political responsibility in a personal way. And I'll try and explain what I mean yeah, there. Could you unpack that a little bit? Because yeah. I, I might so have understood what you meant, but I'm not sure. <laughs> sure, sure. So for, for example, right, I think there's a lot of folks who say, if you um, own a vehicle, uh, you know, a non-electric vehicle, or even an electric vehicle, right, because a lot of electricity comes from sources that are non-renewable, blah, 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 sure. right, that, um, that you personally are evil and bad and contributing to climate change, and, um, and I think that that misses the bigger picture, uh, bigger picture being, you know, a small number of corporations and a smaller number of uh, government regulations or lack thereof are responsible for the overwhelming majority of the climate change problem, 
right? And I think that uh, what I worry about is people saying like, okay, I'm going to focus inward and I personally will drive less and fly less and compost more. And that will make such little difference. It is almost meaningless, um, not completely meaningless. And I, I have a lot of um, respect for people who want to put that on their own shoulders, who are willing to make those sacrifices. I think that is awesome and wonderful. And I think that if you ignore the reality, which is that political systemic change is the only way to make a big difference here. Uh, you are burying your head in the sand just as much, if not more, than someone who you know, drives a giant SUV and flies a private jet. I agree with you that there needs to be sort of this, this, big, um, this big change. And yet in, in tech, there are some big companies, right? So we have some big organizations who are big enough to kind of um, make a significant difference one way or the other. Um, obviously, the, sort of like the, yeah. the, the big giants like Google and Amazon and, and Apple and so on, which obviously the kind of companies, uh, they, they're almost countries. Unfortunately, uh, their incentives are all wrong, right? So the, the, only, the only way that you will get Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, et cetera, to, to change uh, the way that they operate is to change their incentive structures, basically by making certain practices legal or illegal. You know, as, as so long as they their primary responsibility is show shareholders, you know, uh, earnings per share growth every quarter, that they're, they're, they're going to screw the world in order to do that. Right. And that that is because that is what their CEOs and their executive teams are tasked with by shareholders. And so you you either change things at the political level and make it illegal or extremely difficult or ludicrously expensive for these companies to operate in these ways that are you know, causing climate change, causing pollution, car causing you know, carbon issues, uh, or you, you give it up, right? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think there's um, a personal solution or a like, well, I won't buy Apple products, and that'll show those Apple folks that they shouldn't manufacture these. That, no, that no. means so it, much less than convincing five of your neighbors to vote in a way that will you know, actually change the structure. No, individually that wouldn't work. If it was a if it was a big um, kind of protest level sure. thing, that might that might work. But even so, I'm not sure what the best way of doing something like that. It's not what I have in mind to be honest. Um, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> but, exciting but, to it's exciting to imagine, but it feels like it is history breaking, right? That, we, that Historically, we've not generally been able to organize individual consumers with that level of um, thoughtfulness around you know, uh, changing their habits, whereas shifting an election a couple of points can, can literally change the world, right? Yes. And so I, I think that um, so, if we're gonna focus energy somewhere, that, that's where to put it. So, to bring it back down to because even though even though perhaps the level of impact of a company like Moz or Sparktoro or, or sort of similar sized companies um, is to a large degree incomparable, right? To yeah, negligible. Like Amazon, for example. Um, that doesn't mean that we sh we should um, uh, act in the worst possible way. Right. So, oh, sure. yeah, so it'll be like, oh, you know, what I'm doing is just a drop in the bucket so I can behave in the sort of worst way possible because it doesn't yep. matter as much. So is, is this um, is are these topics, things that have come up for you in the companies that you founded and run? And how do those conversations get handled internally? Yeah, uh, let's see. So at Moz, I think we um, maybe it was four or five years ago, just after I stepped down as CEO, uh, we had an initiative where we looked into uh, carbon credits and uh, becoming a more green company, a more green office space, um, implementing a work from home a week, a day a week policy, um, trying to uh, set up more public transportation options for uh, employees. So, you know, these small things that are on the margin, but I think generally, make people feel a little bit better and, and have a tiny impact um, 
on their own and maybe collectively, you know, it's one of those things, right? Like you talked about with Apple. Well, if every company did that, it would make a bit of a difference, right? And yeah. so we, we tried to do some of those things. Um, I don't, I would not say that Moz was a, you know, nine out of 10 on this stuff, but maybe a seven, maybe sometimes an eight, right? Okay. Uh, much how, better how than did, any, did not think? as good as it could be. How did these things come up in Moz? Was it, you know, you had some like one person who was really sort of keen and kept bugging you <laughs> or did it come from you or the leadership team? Huh, let's see. I think usually, I think it usually came, it came from several sources. Sometimes it was myself or people on the executive team um, and Moz's current CEO, Sarah Bird, is, is generally very left-leaning and very, um, you know, obviously a climate science embracer and uh, those kinds of things. She, um, and she, you know, supported these types of initiatives. Um, the, some of them came from individual employees who sort of brought it up, right, in, in one setting or another. Uh, some of it came from, you know, I'd read an article about some company doing something that you know, could help. I think the carbon mm -hmm. credits thing was one of those, right? Like, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. let's look at our cloud spend and, and, and our software use and yada, yada. And let's go figure out like, hey, we're spending this much with, you know, AWS. What does that mean in terms of um, okay. you know, carbon credits? Oh, it's a few hundred dollars a year. Let's just buy that, right? Like, let's go carbon neutral with our server spend. Where uh, did you buy this stuff? Where did, you, where did you, do you know where you spent the money for, you know, carbon credits and so on? I, I don't remember. Um, yeah, I'd have to, I don't have access to my email anymore from Moz, but <laughs> I, could, I was going to say I could look it up, but uh, I could not look it up anymore. Um, yeah, it no, was. it's not so important to be honest. I'm just curious, like just digging for details. And yeah, we did a little bit of research into, you know, hey, what are the most effective ones? And um, okay. You know, what what, there, there are some, right, there are some that are uh, largely, you know, window dressing only, and then there's a few that are, no, no, they, here's how they invest, right? It's not just planting trees, it's also, uh, you know, they spend money so that uh, these types of fuels won't be used, they spend money so that these types yeah, yeah. of energy sources will be invested in, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there, there's some that, that are better than others. I, I'm sure you can uh, search around and, and find those lists. At the time, we tried to pick one that we thought was um, useful and, and not window dressing. So you said for SparkSor, you funded this differently, right? You've got 35, 35 angel investors um, with, a, with a profit sharing. And when, so when you say profit sharing model, do you mean um that future employees will be part of that or is it a profit yeah, that's exactly that, that's uh exactly part of our plan right so that um essentially we raised 1.3 million dollars uh from these 35 angels once we make you know an equivalent of 1.3 million in profit and pay back our investors their initial sum everyone gets to participate in profit sharing sort of to the to the amount of their ownership in the business so, okay. you know, if you put in $50,000, maybe you own, you know, whatever, 1% of SparkToro. And so, you know, if we okay. make a million dollars, you're going to get $10,000 in your uh, share this year, right? That kind of thing. Okay. And next year you get 20, whatever it is, right? That, that kind of thing. And so um, the, uh, the fundamental difference, right? There's, there's a bunch of differences, but I think as it relates back to this issue we're talking about around, around climate change is that the very interesting thing is that our incentive is not growth at all costs. Okay, that's exactly what I was going to ask you about. What is the incentive structure that you're that you're trying to create here? Because yeah, so it, it comes back to incentives about, a lot. Yeah, so if you think about the classic venture capital investment model, right, which which most folks are familiar with because it's become, you know, so discussed and sort of worshipped in the tech press, uh, venture capital you know, fund puts money into a hundred companies with the hope that, or, you know, I, they hope all hundred will be successful. That never happens, right? <laughs> Generally speaking, they know that 95 of those companies will go bust and not really return them much of anything. Uh, three or four will make them some decent amount of money. And then one or two will return the entire fund. Right? Yeah, that's the, the unicorn, right? And so every, yeah. basically every venture capitalist goal is identify companies that might be future unicorns. 
not um, look for and help uh, businesses that have a high, a high chance of surviving and being profitable long term to sustainably grow in a fashion that keeps them alive. Right, so very, very, very different. So that, that does two things, right? That incentive model does two things. One, it encourages every company to spend fast in order to create fast growth, right? Because growth rate and market dominance and, and building monopolies is essentially what every investment is trying to do. Every investment, if you and I run an investment fund, right? Every mm -hmm. company we invest in, we're trying to make them the next Google, Facebook, Apple, yeah, Amazon, yeah, yeah, exactly. Microsoft. We work. Yeah. Well, maybe not. We work. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I know Airbnb, yeah. right? That kind of yeah. thing. Uh, those giant companies, right? Companies that have extraordinary growth rates tend to break a lot of things along the way, um, and and the climate is often one of those things. And uh, they tend to be. They tend to have the same goals and sort of responsibilities, fiduciary responsibilities that public companies have, uh, broadly speaking, which is essentially growth at all costs, market dominance at all costs. And that is very different from sustainable, profitable, independent, um, live up to values, those kinds of things, right? So uh, my, a friend of mine uh, named Mara Zapeta down in Portland, and uh, along with a, a, several other women in the entrepreneurship space, created this moniker of, of zebras versus unicorns. And I, I would encourage any of your listeners or, or viewers to, to check it out. They, they did a really cool series of articles around this. And okay. Casey and I actually adopted this uh, philosophy for SparkToro. So if you go to the About Us page on SparkToro, we have this like, zebras, we're a zebra, not a unicorn. Okay, um, okay. And, and the, other, sure. the, the other problem that it contributes to is income inequality. Right, because essentially, if you invest in a hundred companies and only one or two of them are going to be successful, you're essentially trying to concentrate wealth in the hands of a very small number of founders, right? Founders and investors, and everybody else does not do well. Right, that's the and that is the known motivation going in. That's the model, right? The model is to create income inequality. Um, and and try and bet on a very small handful of winners. And investors would say, hey, that's just how the economy works, right? Our economy rewards winner take all. And I think, frankly, I, I think that's bullshit. I think that's a, <laughs> a crap excuse, right? Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. that we, uh, and especially the owners of capital, right? The investors themselves, they get to determine how investments function. And if they choose, if they want to, they can decide to do what Tiny Seed Fund and SparkToro and these other companies have done, which is essentially a model that encourages sustainable, profitable uh, um, pluralities of companies to compete in spaces as opposed to one monopoly takes all of it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting at the moment to see more and more of these currently small companies, but very, very often you this is how things start, right? This is how the ball gets rolling with very small things um, happening uh, seemingly by coincidence at the same time. And then yeah, you know, your fingers <laughs> crossed. We're, yeah. we're at the start of a movement and this isn't just an aberration in the, in the flow. Well, yeah, I hope so. I hope so because um, it would be uh, one of the stats I read recently and I, and I won't, uh, I don't want to, um, misquote but um it's something along the lines of the internet um as a whole um having a larger carbon footprint than air travel uh oh. currently right in terms of the amount of it and so I, I don't know what they mean but i didn't read this in detail so i don't know what the what the definition of internet is right, um, right. for this so do they mean just the infrastructure running the the network or is, is it including everything down to every mobile phone right which if you if you do take it to that extreme um it does kind of make sense that it's it oh would, and, and uh, e-commerce right e-commerce is a huge contributor uh because you have so many more vehicle hours and so many more um uh, uh well, know, point the, to point the, deliveries the, as opposed to yes, exactly. you know a single place where everyone goes to get their stuff yeah yeah so and in a lot of these, I mean, Uber keeps coming up as an example of a company that could, in theory, 
have a positive impact on something like this, but is right. instead incentivizing more travel, right? Or the way- Yeah, you... both incentivizing more travel and not, because their model essentially loses money, right? They, do, they don't even have the margin to be able to say, hey, let's encourage energy efficiency, let's encourage efficient transport, let's encourage you know, investments in electric vehicles or investments in uh, carbon offsetting, any of that, right? Because yeah. they, they lose money on every ride. So. Okay, <laughs> so I don't I don't want to get into a sort of hey Uber kind of fest or anything. Yeah, like yeah, that. I, that's not I, that's not the point. So I um, think you could say the same about Airbnb. I think you could say the same about uh, Amazon. I think you could say the same um, about Facebook, right? I think that that you could sure. arguably say that Facebook's um, lack of thoughtfulness around the American 2016 election. Mm -hmm. Largely led to you know dissolution of many environmental impacting long term large scale environmental impacting uh, things that you know are going to be very very difficult to reverse at the most at one of the most critical times in history to to make that change. Why is it that we're not talking about this problem? Like you don't see it as a topic that comes up in conferences. We talk about gender now, we talk about diversity and inclusion and company culture and things like that. And yet the fact yeah. that you get, you know, thousands of people traveling to conferences constantly, that you have all these servers using air conditioning, blah, 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 without a thought to the, because it's not like we don't want these things. I love computers. <laughs> Um, but why are we not talking about it? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there are probably three big reasons. One is because uh, most folks who are part of you know, uh, web and technology conferences, uh, marketing conferences, uh, most of those people feel that, and I think relatively accurately, feel that they can make somewhere between no difference and an extremely tiny difference, right? Mm -hmm. That their personal impact is incredibly low versus say a conference on uh, energy or uh, a conference on cloud computing, right? A cloud computing event might be a reasonable place where you could have uh, those types of discussions. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, I think that many conference organizers and speakers feel that these are politically charged issues. I think that's less true where you are, right? In, in Europe, it tends to be, you know, most of the population is very accepting. And this is true in even in uh, Asia and Africa and the Middle East, that most of the population is very accepting of the idea that climate change is real and it is human caused, right? And we must do something. Uh, that's and not does it look that right. way to you. <laughs> uh, well, so I, I just look at the statistics, right? Yeah, yeah of like course, yeah. 80% um, of UK citizens yeah. when surveyed say uh, climate change is real and human caused. Yeah. And it's like 51% of Americans, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So the United States has a unique problem in that this issue has been politicized and thus uh, events and organizers and you know, folks in the field feel like it's not a topic they should address because it's you know, polit a political issue. Um, and then I think the third one is that it is largely non-strategic and non-tactical to the businesses. So uh, as compared to, for example, diversity and inclusion, Right, so diversity, inclusion, gender issues, issues of racism and and sexism and and uh, GLBTQ plus types of issues, which are getting addressed, but in you know, it's not like the topic of a keynote, right? But it'll be it'll have some uh, some mention at at these events, and that is generally, I think, both because it is becoming more accepted and also because it is strategic to the businesses, right? So if you can become more inclusive, you can hire uh, a broader, a wider breadth of people, you can appeal to a broader audience, you can, you know, sell more of your goods, all those kinds of things, right? So there's a direct, um, direct impact, whereas, hey, if we talk about climate change, we are helping the world and our children and the planet long term. Tell me about how it impacts my business positively. So, well, that's kind of it's a tougher sell. I kind of get that, except for one thing, um, which I find sort of hard to completely understand, which is what changed to make this, to make the diversity and inclusion debate tactical now? Because, you know, 10, 15 years ago, 
um, the conversation was very much as it is now about environmental issues, which is like, oh, uh, I can't get more girls to, you know, it's like, this is an educational conference. Like, go, you know, we should tackle this in a university symposium about how to get more women to do STEM subjects or things like that. Um, whereas it turned out that companies could do quite a lot to recruit and train stuff you know so you you've been you know you've been kind of running companies and being in in kind of maybe having these conversations for probably much longer than i have um partly because i don't run companies <laughs> um but but um what changed where, where was the where was the point where going from oh it's not it's not the you know the ceos or the head of hr responsibility or even even ability to affect the diversity that we hire to oh this is a tactical advantage to us yeah so uh, I think it is a mistake unfortunately to look back in time recently and say something changed in the last five or ten or fifteen years I think what in fact you know if you look at the at the course of the last um, probably 70 years, right, since about World War II, right, that, that you would see what happened in Western economies is generally speaking that more women came into the workforce, mostly because of uh, shifting societal norms, shifting cultural norms, and the war itself, right, which demanded, yeah. uh, demanded a workforce that was unavailable because men were sent to war, right? <laughs> exactly. And so, um, as a result of that, you got more women into these professional roles. And as that happened, slowly you started to see the sexism. And as, that, as, as it was slowly seen and reported on, and women, a few women came into a few positions of power, they were able to amplify those voices and talk about them. And then you saw a few men paying attention, and then those voices got louder and louder, right? And so it became this tiny snowball that rolled down a hill. Um, and I, I think that, you know, what would be a mistake is to go, well, 10 years ago, web marketing conferences didn't talk about diversity and inclusion, and now they do. And to ignore the fact that, that this snowball started and was already rolling for a long period of time, I think change seems fast, but is often uh, the result of forces building up. And so I am very hopeful. I, I really am, Richard. I am very hopeful that what you know, folks, voices like Al Gore in the 1990s started around climate change and, and many, many other people. Um, he's just the, one of the ones that comes to mind, right? But many, many other people in the, in the even in the 70s, 80s, 90s, right? People That's talking true. about this stuff, uh, bringing it up, that that ball is also starting to roll down a hill. And granted, the times are getting more perilous, but I don't, I don't think... Uh, I don't think that 20 years from now we will still be in the same place. I think we're um, we're on our way to having those conversations. I, the only question is, is it too late, right? Have we already have we sort of doomed ourselves by virtue of you know the political leadership we've put into place around the world and their um, inability to address this issue fast enough? And now you know, uh, barring some sort of miracle scientific breakthrough in carbon sequestration. Uh, we're all screwed. Hello, me again. Well, that was Rand Fishkin talking to me about the climate emergency and how we can all make a positive change to the environment and industries we live and operate in. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe at fatalerror.blog for news and updates about new episodes. And if you'd like to contribute to the project, please visit fatalair.blog forward slash contribute. And of course, if you have any feedback, comments, or questions about anything at all, please drop me an email on richard at fatalair.blog. We'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.